Okay, today we are talking about the Pentecostal tradition, sometimes called the Pentecostal Charismatic tradition. There's a lot of names for this tradition, uh, but it's the fourth of the big traditions we'll be discussing. As we all know, there are many different kinds of Christians in the world, but almost all of those can be grouped into one of four big traditions. And those big traditions are Catholicism, the Orthodox tradition, Protestantism, and Pentecostalism, which is what we're going to be talking about today. 20%, uh, roughly 20%, one out of every five, one of every five Christians in the world today would be considered Pentecostal or charismatic. Uh, Pentecostal Christians are a little harder to count than other kinds of Christians, uh, but this map shows at least where Pentecostal Christians are especially prominent. Uh, more than half the population of Guatemala can be considered Pentecostal, 56% of the population of Kenya, 49% of Brazil, which is a huge country, 44% uh, of the Philippines, about a quarter of Americans uh, can be considered Pentecostal charismatic in some way, where they live. There are five parts to this talk. Uh, first, we want to talk about Pentecostalism as an emerging tradition. It's not as well formed as the other three we've discussed. Then we're going to talk a little bit about Pentecostal history, Pentecostal views of salvation, the power and gifts of the Spirit, and finally, why the Pentecostal movement has grown so quickly in the past hundred years. So, here we go. Pentecostalism as an emerging tradition. Uh, Pentecostalism is a fourth tradition. These are the other four, three traditions we've talked about and their relative size compared to each other. The Pentecostal tradition has emerged out of Protestantism. And it begins about the year 1900. By the 1960s, it has gotten bigger and it has also begun to penetrate Catholicism to some degree. Today, the Pentecostal charismatic tradition looks something like this. And what makes it different than the other traditions is that its boundaries are a bit more porous, so they're in dotted lines, and it overlaps with Protestantism and Catholicism and Orthodoxy to some degree. But, but, but I, the, what I want to point out is that this is not unique. If we would actually chart the four big ca Christian traditions, there's overlap between some of the others as well. Uh, there's overlap between Protestantism and Catholicism in groups like the Church of England, the Anglican tradition, and Lutheranism, with, which consider themselves partly Catholic and partly Protestant. There's overlap between Orthodoxy and Catholicism in churches known as Eastern Rite churches. But there's more significant overlap with Pentecostal Charismatic Christianity and the other three traditions. Um, every Christian tradition has three dimensions to it. There are certain ideas that are emphasized, there's certain practices or ways of life that are emphasized, and there's certain affections or emotions that are emphasized. One of the things that makes the Pentecostal tradition different is that affections and experience play a huge role in this tradition, bigger than in any of the other three. Uh, Early Pentecostal leaders were great with creating phrases. One of my favorite is one early Pentecostal leader said, the experience of being filled with the Spirit and becoming Pentecostal was like swallowing God liquidized. A great image. Uh, another one explained simply, my experience is my creed. So experience plays a huge role in Pentecostal Christianity. Like Protestantism, Pentecostalism is a movement it's not an institution. But what's different is that the boundaries of Protestantism are contested. What I mean by that is different Protestant groups will have slightly different ideas of where the boundaries of Protestantism lie. So they argue a bit, but they believe there are, there are relatively clear boundaries on what makes you Protestant. What's different about Pentecostalism is that the Pentecostal movement has fuzzy boundaries. It's a little more difficult to know whether you're in this movement or out of this movement. And let me explain why. Pentecostalism is largely a matter of emphasizing certain spiritual gifts that
that other Christians also recognize and honor to some degree. Uh, so visions and miracles. Many Christians would say these things are possible. Pentecostal Christians stress it. Divine healing, speaking in tongues. There's a variety of miraculous gifts of the Spirit that Pentecostalism specially emphasizes, even though other Christians may believe in these things to some degree. So the question is, how much emphasis do you need to have on these special spiritual gifts of the power of the Spirit to be considered fully Pentecostal? That's why the lines of this tradition are still blurry or fuzzy as opposed to being clear cut. In some ways, the relationship between Protestantism and Pentecostalism today is something like the relationship between Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy in, say, the year 1200. These two traditions are beginning to move, but they st separate from each other, but they have, still have a lot in common. So this is a new tradition, a still emerging tradition, uh, as opposed to one that's been fixed and solidified over time. Uh, because it's so new, there's still uh, some argument and questions about what we should call this movement. Uh, some people simply call this a spirit-filled movement, spirit-filled Christianity. Others would call it charismatic Christianity. Uh, in some places like Africa or in Latin America, sometimes these are just called independent churches. Uh, a more common, a, a term that's being used more and more frequently now is renewalist to cover all of these different groups. But the term I'm going to use, the term we'll use here, is just Pentecostal. It's what the movement began with, and it's a, it's a phrase that still captures a lot of the emphases of this movement in terms of focus on the Spirit and the special gifts of the Holy Spirit. A little bit of Pentecostal history. Pentecostalism is often identified with beginning with a revival that was held in this building in Los Angeles on Azusa Street in 1906. The person on the right is William J. Seymour, who was the person who led this revival. It lasted for about two and a half years, and people from all over the world came to Azusa Street to see what was going on. They got a taste of Pentecostalism, and they took it back with them wherever they lived all around the world. But it's important to note that what was happening in Los Angeles at the Azusa Street Mission was not the only flowering or beginning of Pentecostalism that was taking place in the world. Uh, in other places, even in the late 1800s, independent churches were beginning to emerge in Africa that have many of the characteristics that Pentecostal Christianity has today. A stress on visions and dreams and spiritual power. So that's uh, emerging in a different place, not necessarily connected with what was taking place in Los Angeles. Uh, in India, there was a woman named Pandita Ramabai who had a mission uh, in western India uh, and it, early in the 1900s, there was a revival that went through this mission that she ran where people began to speak in tongues and miraculous things happened. It's another place where the Pentecostal movement seems to have started kind of simultaneously in different parts of the world. Same thing happens in Chile where this person, Willis Hoover, is a Methodist, but all of a sudden strange things start to happen in his church and it becomes a Methodist Pentecostal church in Chile in the early 1900s. There's three phases that Pentecostal history has gone through, even though it's only about 100 years old. The first phase begins about 1900 and lasts to about 1960. And this is associated with something called classical Pentecostal denominations. We'll talk about this again in a minute. And African independent churches. Classical Pentecostal denominations are groups like the Assemblies of God that have formally created denominations or churches based on Pentecostal theological principles and beliefs. Phase two began around 1960 and lasted into the 1980s, and this is often known as the charismatic movement. What happened in the charismatic movement is that people who were not necessarily Pentecostal began to experience things like what Pentecostals were experiencing and began to talk about their Christian faith in the ways Pentecostal Christians were talking about it. But even though they were having those experiences, they continued to stay as Methodists or Baptists or Mennonites or Catholics or whatever. They didn't leave their churches to become Pentecostal. They exercised those Pentecostal kinds of gifts of the Spirit 
within the context of their own denominations that were not Pentecostal. The last phase, the third phase, is from 1980 to the present. Uh, this is sometimes called the neo-charismatic movement. Uh, one of the things that's emphasized or connected with the neo-charismatic movement is a belief in the word of faith, or sometimes called health and wealth gospel, that God promises people health and wealth in addition to various gifts of the Spirit. In terms of uh, how these three phases uh, connect with each other, they actually overlap with each other. They're still all around. And in terms of the growth of the movement, what we see is something like this. There's been a growth of classical Pentecostalism, a growth of independent churches, but then layered on top of that becomes this incredible growth of charismatic movement and then of these newer neo-charismatic churches. So you have this rude takeoff of Pentecostal charismatic Christianity starting in 1900, now almost 400 million followers of Pentecostal faith around the world in 100 years. Pentecostal view of salvation. Uh, Catholics and Orthodox Christians see conversion, becoming a Christian, as a lifelong process that has no clear and decisive single point where you move from being unsaved or lost to being saved. Protestants, by contrast, emphasize that salvation is an event. It takes place at a given point in time. Pentecostal Christians have the best of both worlds. They believe it is an event and a process at the same time. In terms of the smiley face model of salvation, it looks something like this. Pentecostals believe, like Protestants and Catholics, that people are born lost or separated from God. And through conversion or regeneration, they become spiritually, spiritually alive and able to have a relationship with God. Becoming spiritually alive, though, for Pentecostal Christians is only the beginning. If you become a baby and you stay a baby, that's, there's no benefit in that. The whole point is to grow and to grow closer to God and to grow more full in the experience of God's spirit in your own life. Uh, many Pentecostals talk about this in terms of regeneration, sanctification, and then the fullness of the spirit or the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And when we die... You go to heaven, but for many Pentecostal Christians, the belief is that even in heaven, we will continue to experience new growth and development as Christians. So this process that begins on earth with regeneration continues through time, and it continues through eternity. Now, while this is the main language, the, the main sort of way that Pentecostals talk about Christianity or salvation, uh, in the background, there's a lingering sort of Protestant sense that even while there's this process going on, the singular event of regeneration also has its value and makes you in some sense right with God in the same way that Protestants think about having imputed righteousness that allows you to stand in God's presence. So again, Pentecostal Christianity is in this process of emerging as a tradition. It doesn't just have one voice to speak about salvation. It has at least these two voices of event and process. Moving ever deeper into the fullness of God in both time and eternity. Spiritual power and the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, some of the things that distinguish Pentecostal Christianity from other cr forms of Christianity, uh, one would be the emphasis on the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's a sense in many Pentecostal groups uh, that this, like regeneration, which is an event, the baptism with the Holy Spirit is also an event, and it's an event when the Holy Spirit comes into your life in a new way. And for many Pentecostals, they would say it comes into your life in a way that you can physically feel God coming into your life. Uh, the baptism with the Holy Spirit is often associated with speaking in tongues. This is a newspaper from Los Angeles while the Azusa revival was going on. One of the headlines, weird babble of tongues taking place at the Azusa Street Mission. But part of what Pentecostals would say is that when God comes into your life, you feel it physically, and God actually takes control of your life to some degree physically. And it's manifest in one way by God taking control of your tongue and having you speak words that you do not control 
but that speak through you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, most Pentecostal Christians also believe strongly in healing, that God heals people today. Uh, some Pentecostals believe God can raise people from the dead. Uh, Pentecostal Christians also believe you can be slain in the spirit. If you've ever watched Benny Hinn on TV, he'll go up and touch people and they fall down. Okay, there's a sense in which people can be so overcome by the spirit that it simply knocks them out, being slain in the spirit. Different Pentecostal groups will understand and explain these things in slightly different ways. There are other dramatic things that can happen in Pentecostal circles. But what's important is that there's this tremendous emphasis placed on these kinds of special and miraculous uh, experiences of, of the Holy Spirit. And what makes Pentecostalism distinctive is that it is assumed that these kinds of miraculous events ought to be part of the normal Christian experience. They shouldn't be extraordinary, something you see once or twice in your lifetime. They should be part of the normal Christian experience. God's power revealed through people on earth, through gifts of healing, through gifts of speaking in tongues, through other experiences. Finally, why is Pentecostalism growing so quickly around the world? Uh, Pentecostals themselves would obviously say the reason Pentecostalism is growing so quickly is because it's the work of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is causing it to grow. But there are some other characteristics of this movement that help explain what's going on and why Pentecostalism has become so attractive in the global age in which we now live. One is that Pentecostalism has no connection with colonialism. Catholicism, Protestantism, and even Orthodoxy have histories of colonialism politically, militarily taking over other people and forcing your faith on them. Colonialism. Pentecostalism has none of that. Uh, Pentecostalism has no educational requirements. If you want to be a pastor in a, in a Protestant tradition, you need to go to college, typically, then you need to go to seminary. Same thing for Catholics, same things for Orthodox. It takes a long time to get the skills and equipment and credentialing to be a minister. In the Pentecostal movement, all you need is the Holy Spirit, and you're on your own. You don't need education. It doesn't take time. You can go too. Pentecostalism moves easily across cultures. Uh, Pentecostalism isn't locked into a kind of uh, Western uh, way of thinking, like, like Protestantism and Catholicism. And it's not linked into the sort of tightly controlled liturgical forms of orthodoxy. Pentecostalism is fluid, it's adjustable, it's adaptable, and it moves easily across cultures, and it empowers people in different cultures. In terms of empowerment, one of the, one of the strongest reasons Pentecostalism is growing throughout the world most of the Pentecostals in the world are incredibly poor. Most Pentecostals in the world live in places like slums in Latin America, or they live at the edges of the cities uh, in, in Asia, or they live in Africa. There's an incredible poverty in the world, and Pentecostalism has spread among the poorer parts of the world, not the wealthier parts of the world, partly because having the Spirit come into your life and gaining some sort of spiritual power gives people who are otherwise powerless a new sense that they have control over their own lives by God's grace and through the help of the Holy Spirit. So empowering the powerless. Finally, uh, one of the central emotions of Pentecostalism is in fact joy. Other Christian traditions emphasize obligation or duty or even gratitude. But for Pentecostals, what Christianity should do for you is make you happy. Uh, when you go to a Pentecostal worship service, the whole tenor of the worship service is joyous, bubbling out. I mean, this is not about being tightly controlled. It's not about having burdens put on you. It's about freeing you from burdens and experiencing the love and joy of God. So it's all those things taken together that explain at least partly why the Pentecostal movement has grown so fast in the last hundred years. And that is a brief introduction to the Pentecostal tradition. <laughs>